Have you heard a phrase something smells very fishy? Have you ever wondered on what basis we decide whether something is fishy or not? Curious to know? Hear it from the neuroscientist Dr. Nixon Abraham, an assistant professor at ISO Pune. Congratulations Dr. Abraham for your recent article in Cell Reports and a very warm welcome at Science Media Center ISO Pune. Thank you Kandi. In your recent publication, your group tested an important question of how rodents sample the smell stimuli of varying complexities while they are challenged with decision making tasks. Could you explain this more? Okay. Um, let me start uh, by uh, giving you an example. Okay. You are going to ask me some questions now, right? And then uh, I have to answer your questions. Right. So, if you force me to answer the questions very quickly, yeah. so my answers won't be that accurate. Okay. But after I hear the questions from you, if I think for some time, mm -hmm. and then if I answer, okay. I think my answers would be more accurate. Okay. So, we call this theorem as speed accuracy trade-off okay. theorem, right? Taking time to make it more uh, accurate right. and um, this uh, phenomenon is uh, commonly observed in all sensory systems okay and but in olfactory system this is a debated topic okay in the sense of smell processing pathway yeah right. and the debate is nothing but so you are smelling uh, very simple stimulus let's okay. say you take two different foods mm -hmm and uh, an apple and, and an orange okay, okay. and then uh, you, you your eyes are closed mm -hmm. you can't uh, touch the foods right and uh, you just smell it and then you have to tell me so whether they are uh, which one is uh, orange which one is apple okay. whether you can distinguish between these two mm. that's one uh, one task and your brain needs certain amount of time okay which is in the millisecond range yeah now i am going to take a few apples and few oranges okay in one basket mm -hmm. and uh, we can think of maybe three orange two apple okay and in the second one um, the other way around okay now i am asking you to uh, smell this again okay. and then i am asking you whether you can distinguish okay so you will be able to distinguish these two the mixed smell right. but your brain needs longer processing time right to distinguish because that one is a more complex compared to the one that i said before yeah right and um, so that's the, the that's the th theorem uh, when you have complex stimuli okay the, your brain needs longer time period to process okay. compared to the simple stimuli okay uh, whatever the stimuli it doesn't matter right okay and uh, to uh, to make it more accurate, your brain is needing more time. And if you push the person or the subject okay. to make the decision in a faster way, right. so the accuracy levels goes down. Okay. Uh, and um, so few scientists in the olfaction field, mm -hmm. they say that um, uh, the processing time, we can, uh, there are different terminology. Okay. Uh, the processing time or the reaction time or the discrimination time. Okay. And uh, between simple uh, stimuli okay. versus the complex stimuli, uh, few scientists say that it's the same. The system needs the same amount of time okay. to distinguish a simple stimuli and complex stimuli. And uh, s few other groups, including us, we say that the system needs longer time period. Okay. To process complex stimuli compared to the simple stimuli. Yeah. And so, th as this uh, debate is happening in the field for the last, I think it started in 2003. Okay. Uh, for some time, and uh, it was like a ping pong. So mm -hmm. um, they published saying that uh, there is no difference okay. in processing time, and then uh, we said there is a time difference. And uh, then again, they publish something else, uh, some, some other paper saying okay. that there is no difference. So we decided to uh, investigate this issue in detail mm -hmm. by taking um, uh, different classes of uh, chemicals. Okay. So in total, we used 
16 uh, different order pairs okay. and we measured the discrimination time for these 16 different order pairs okay. and what we found was the discrimination time or the processing time was varying for all different order pairs. Okay. Okay. And there was a clear dependence on the complexity of the stimuli yeah. compared to the simple ones. Okay. When you have a something, when you have something present smelling, mm. uh, let's say, uh, you are trying a new perfume. Right. Uh, usually, we humans, what we do, uh, we take this strip and then put some perfume and right. then we take a deep breath mm. like that. Right. Okay. Um, but these animals, when they are challenged with uh, novel odors, they sniff with very high frequency. Okay. They do it like, like mm. that. The sniffing frequency is very high. Yeah. And, um, and uh, now the question is whether the sniffing behavior is mm. affecting their discrimination ability or decision making ability. Okay. Okay. Whether they have different strategies mm -hmm. when they are challenged with simple task okay. versus the complex task. The olfaction is a fast sense and then there is a clear dependence of the olfactory processing time on the complexity of the stimuli right. uh, that they are challenged with. Okay. And this time difference is independent of the sampling behavior. Yeah, so okay. that's the interesting to know. So we would like to know what makes you excited to work in circuit neuroscience. So the circuit neuroscience is uh, interesting, um, not only for me, for many <laughs> neuroscientists. Uh, just because if you think of any uh, brain dysfunctions, okay, uh, as an example, uh, what causes the brain dysfunctions, right? So mm -hmm. I think we have to start uh, from which circuits are responsible for this uh, dysfunction. Right. Right. So, the f uh, studying the causality mm -hmm. in neuroscience, that is uh, that's one of the major challenges that we have in neuroscience. Okay. And why I was attracted to the circuit neuroscience? Just because I will be able to find mm -hmm. different circuits that are responsible for specific behaviors. Okay. And that was my attraction towards the circuit neuroscience. So, I did my uh, bachelor's and master's in chemistry mm. and then uh, I wanted to uh, study biology and then uh, one of the interesting topic for me was neuroscience okay. and then I was looking for options to do some research in neuroscience mm -hmm. and then uh, uh, why olfaction or the circuit neuroscience uh, because the olfaction and taste are chemical senses. Okay. So, I thought of okay, uh, I will start with one of those senses mm -hmm. and uh, it happened to, um, sorry, uh, uh, after the masters I was looking for the, uh, different options and then I was uh, meeting with Professor Obed Siddiqui from NCBS okay. uh, who is the, who is known as the father of molecular biology in India, yes. a great scientist mm -hmm. and um, so I worked in his lab okay. uh, working on drosophila olfaction behavior mm -hmm. and uh, that was the I think that was my okay. uh, turning point. Okay, I would I also like to know how you chose the field of research like did you pre-decide during your childhood that you want to become a researcher or did it happen eventually? I wanted to become a medical doctor but uh, I mean my family financial situations and all different things. Um, I could not make it and uh, then uh, my uh, brother is a scientist, Okay. Uh, he is a cancer biologist mm -hmm. and uh, while I was uh, studying he was doing his PhD. Yeah, okay. um, he is 13 years uh, mm -hmm. elder than me mm -hmm. and he was always a motivating factor for me okay. because uh, we were, he used to uh, explain lots of things. Okay. about what he was doing and after my plus two uh, he took me to uh, Adair Cancer Research Institute mm -hmm. and I st went and I stayed there for a month okay. time and I think I happened to meet many of his friends, mm -hmm. interacted uh, with all of them and then I happened to see his lab. 
Okay. So then I think I decided okay, so I will go for the research field. Nice to know. Again, coming to the scientific part, which methods and tools you use in your research? So as we are doing the circuit uh, neuroscience, mm -hmm. um, so finally what matters is the causality. So you have to have the tools to study the causality. Co Sorry, by saying causality, yeah. I mean, um, so you were uh, now when you ask me some questions, mm -hmm. if I am scared yeah. or if I am uh, excited, mm -hmm you see those differences in my behavior right? right and which are the circuits responsible for that okay. so i need to find the correlation between the circuits and my behavior which is the ultimate readout from the brain yeah and the uh, perfect way of doing this is modifying the circuits mm -hmm. and then uh, at the same time that you do these modifications okay you observe the behavior and okay. you should be able to see the behavior changes Mm -hmm. right when you are modifying the circuit functions okay and um, uh, the and very efficient tool for that one is uh, called optogenetics mm -hmm. uh, it's nothing but um, you can express the light activating channel proteins okay then we do lots of uh, freely moving uh, behavior okay. as well as uh, head restraint behavior why head restraint behavior um, so the task is the same Okay. So, the task that I explained at the beginning, mm. uh, but they are sitting head restraint. Okay. The advantage is when they are doing this behavior, mm. if you want to record the activity of uh, the neurons okay. using the electrical uh, recordings mm -hmm. or the optical recordings, uh, you can do it. As the animal is not moving, technically it is more easier to do this kind of recordings okay. while they are head restraint. And the advantage is as you are recording the behavior as mm -hmm. well as you are recording the neuronal functions at the same time yeah. you can be sure about if you see a neuronal function mm -hmm. and a corresponding behavior you can correlate these two things right okay and uh, then we also use uh, the stereotaxic surgeries okay so this is to target specific circuits or specific areas mm -hmm. in the brain and then we also do uh, um, so a little bit of uh, human or factory behavior experiments in the lab. Okay. Um, it was a new thing. I I was not doing any human or factory behavior experiments uh, during my entire career, but when I started in um, ISER, uh, it took some time to uh, uh, start the animal experiments because we didn't have a functional animal facility. Then I started to think of okay, what else I could do. Yeah then um, I, I thought of okay so why not some human or factory psychophysics yeah. and then we started uh, with those experiments uh, but the long term go goal is if you look at uh, any neurodegenerative diseases many of them uh, yeah. Parkinson's or Alzheimer's the loss of olfaction is one of the primary symptoms okay. and we neglect this uh, a lot yeah. we are yeah. not focusing on our olfactory abilities mm -hmm. And only when we start to lose the taste, right. uh, we think, okay, oh, something is wrong mm. with me. So my uh, olfaction, sense of smell is gone. Now that my taste is gone. Then we get in, uh, walk into the clinic and then get it checked. And whether we can come up with a very efficient method to study the olfactory discrimination abilities okay. in the normal subjects as well as in the patients. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, uh, custom built a olfactory Action, we call it as our factory action meter okay. and um, uh, using that one we have screened uh, lots of uh, healthy subjects now uh, okay. thanks to ISA students they were very enthusiastic to offer us uh, the service and um, now we have the, uh, the some idea about how the olfactory discrimination ability uh, are for the healthy subjects okay. now the next step is trying it in uh, some patient category whether there were any interesting results when you are working with human human subjects i i come from kerala yeah so we use uh, lots of spices mm. okay and uh, the usage of spice levels uh, may be a little bit lower in some other states right and uh, therefore whether uh, we do have any differences in the olfactory discrimination abilities yeah for the people coming from different states okay so that is one of the things that we start we are trying to look at and okay. we are not seeing a difference um, but we have limited number of subjects we have to wait for more 
okay. experiments to happen. Then uh, the other category that we were focusing uh, mm -hmm. was uh, the vegetarians versus non-vegetarians. Okay. Um, the whether the food habits are uh, affecting your uh, olfactory okay. discrimination abilities. Okay. And then, if possible, uh, smokers versus non-smokers. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that it's not that easy to get this category. Now we will move to the next round, which is rapid fire round. I'll be asking you a few questions for which you have to give short and quick responses. Uh, so to start with, scientific journal. Nature science, uh, neuron, nature neuroscience. Okay. Synapse. The chemical synapses as well as the electrical synapses. Okay. Conference. The uh, Society for Neuroscience meeting okay. that happens in New Year's. Collaborations. With uh, Thomas Kuhner. Alan Carlton and Tansu Selikil. Okay. Scientist you admire? Professor Obed Siddigi. Your hobbies? Watching sports. Okay. Especially cricket. Watching movies. Okay. And uh, reading. Favorite movie? It's a uh, Malayalam? Ma Malayalam movie. Valsalim. Okay. Favorite book? Again, I read a lot. Okay. The, uh, the uh, Bush's books. Okay. Support system? My family. So moving on to next question, uh, obtaining your PhD from Max Planck Institute for Medical Research yeah. and postdoc from University of Heidelberg and University of Geneva, how has your journey been from being a PhD student to being a faculty at a prestigious Indian institute? So like how does research life changes from being a student to being a faculty? It's very different in the sense uh, the amount of work that you have to do as a PI. Okay. But the research goal, since I started with Professor Siddiqui, mm -hmm. I was sticking to olfaction. Okay. And um, even olfaction is one of my major, mm. uh, uh, one of the major topic that we research on. And uh, but when it comes to the duties, let's say, mm. as a PI, okay. right? So we have to take care of all the students' projects. Yeah. We have to monitor their work progress. Mm -hmm. So I try to meet them um, once in a week, yeah. uh, meeting face to face, mm -hmm. and then getting some update. Okay. And then we also have the lab meetings, mm -hmm. and then uh, we discuss what they have been doing in the previous week. Yeah. And uh, I have to monitor and I have to control and I have to give the suggestions yeah. and I have to also mentor the students, mm. right? Um, so right now I have seven PhD students in the lab. Okay. So I have to take care of all of their projects. As a PhD student, you just have to take care of your own project right. and your own research work. So this one is very different. Okay. And that's the research part. Okay. And then we have to teach, we have to do lots of administ administrative tasks, mm -hmm. um, taking some responsibilities. I, I have been uh, part of the purchase committee, okay. and then animal ethics committee, human experimental committee. Okay. And all these are uh, time consuming, so you have to be very good uh, with the time management. Yeah. And so I would say it is it is uh, very different from the student life okay but it's very enjoyable i really enjoy spending time with my students and spending time in the lab okay although it is a uh, lot of work mm -hmm. i really enjoy because now you have the full freedom to implement your ideas right, right. when you do your phd and postdoc mm -hmm. i uh, i was fortunate to have certain level of freedom to do the uh, or to design the experiments and do it on my own okay but that's not the case always. Yeah. Um, as a PI, whatever you f think, you discuss with your students and then if uh, the students are interested in that question, then yeah. we can just go for it, right? Okay. So mm -hmm. that uh, freedom is uh, something that I value a lot. So we can really pursue our interests okay. being as an independent PI. Okay, in continuation to this discussion, what we all would like to know is like, what is the most challenging part of supervising a PhD student? That's a tough question. <laughs> Maybe to help them, um, helping them to become self-motivated. 
I think if you're passionate about your work mm -hmm. and if you're self motivated, yeah. you can really enjoy the work. Okay. Right. And uh, so, so I, I think that is something that I find that is a little bit challenging. Uh, your wife is a scientist at National Chemical Laboratory, Pune. So having a partner from the similar field, is it beneficial or competitive? It's very beneficial just because I think we have uh, complementary expertise. Okay. Uh, so she w was trained as a chemist mm -hmm. and uh, I mean I was trained as a neuroscientist. Yeah. And uh, right now we are uh, doing some collaborative projects. So is your work personality different from your home personality? If yes, in what ways? Not really, but I have to be honest. Mm -hmm. I think um, at home, maybe I can uh, express my anger <laughs> a bit more, <laughs> right? But uh, at the workplace, in the lab, uh, I mean, students are friendly with me and I am very friendly with the students. Okay. And uh, we have a really uh, good relation, very friendly atmosphere in the lab. Okay. And therefore, I, maybe I am a bit more composed uh, at the workplace. Okay. But the personalities, but the, it's almost the same. Okay. Yeah. How do you celebrate your research success with your family, especially the latest one? So we went out for dinner okay. and then my uh, daughters were asking uh, why we are going out. Mm. And I explained to them, uh, so we are going out because uh, this is the first paper okay. from the lab. And, um, and then they wanted to know the details. Mm -hmm. And then I explained them. And then uh, my uh, elder daughter, she wanted to know the details. Okay. Uh, she asked me more questions. And then I gave sort of um, similar example that I, I was telling you yeah. uh, to explain what has been done. And uh, then I asked her, do you understand uh, mm. something? And then she, she said, OK, sort of. Mm. Then we reach back and then I ask her, if you have understood something uh, mm -hmm. from what I said, you can uh, write down on the board. Okay. Then she wrote down something okay. and I can uh, show you what she mm -hmm. wrote down. Because it was, uh, I think she got the main message. Okay. I was happy to okay. see that. Yeah. Nice to know. What advice would you like to give to young generation who want to pursue research? So science is not a nine to five job, okay. one thing. And uh, the whoever wants to pursue their career in science, they have to be really passionate about the research that they are going to pursue. And they have to give 200% okay. and fall in love with the research work. Mm -hmm. Then once that happened, they may start dreaming about their uh, experimental results and uh, really great findings yeah. like uh, Kekul's mm -hmm. Benzin dream, yeah. right? Mm. So give 200% and then be passionate. Okay. Where do you think India stands today in science communication? And how can scientists contribute to effective science communication? I think it is improving a lot uh, for the last few years. Okay. Now, uh, we have an excellent system at ISER, right? And you guys are doing a fantastic job. Yeah. Where we could, uh, or in what ways we could improve, let's say we are publishing a, a good paper, then translating these findings for a common or for a non-specialist. So that's something that every PA could contribute, write about that in the local newspapers or wherever. Yeah. And uh, I know that th that is happening now regularly in ISER. Yeah. And then uh, from the PA side, if you have something to share uh, with the community, yeah. and you can also think of not only going to uh, for me, going to an olfaction lab and presenting my work mm -hmm. would be much more easier for me. Just because uh, whatever I am going to speak, they will follow it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if I go to a college, mm -hmm. 
uh, and then I, if I try to speak to the BSc students yeah. uh, who hasn't learned neuroscience a lot, mm -hmm. then I have to uh, really make it as a very common talk, okay. but should carry all the findings that we have. Okay. So we have to have some preparations for that. And um, I, I'm whenever I get a chance, I try to do that. Okay. So in that way, we can uh, sort of popularize the science and also going to different, if I get a chance to go to different schools, mm. I would love to do that. I mean, uh, uh, teaching them very basic uh, neuroscience. Yeah. And I think we still have space yeah. for improving. It was a great experience to have an interacting session with you, Dr. Nixon. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Okay.